And our next presenter is going to continue on the theme of textiles. Uh, I'd like to welcome Anne Richards, who is going to be talking to us today about whether the ancient Egyptian textiles could have pleated themselves. Okay, thank you. Well, um, Rosalind's already raised this question. Can you hear me okay? Uh, Archie, don't dim the lights yet, please, because I'm going to show them something first. Uh, sorry, I should have told you that. Yeah, okay. Uh, yes, Rosalind's already raised this question, um, and of course, it's, I'm working on the basis of ideas that uh, Rosalind has uh, published um, about natural pleating. And I have to say, first of all, that I'm not uh, an archaeologist, uh, Egyptologist or anything. I'm a, a, a weaver, and it just happens that I'm interested in natural pleating. I'm, most of the textiles I make are natural pleated textiles. So I'll just start by showing you the kind of thing I actually make when I'm doing my normal work, as it were. So this is a textile that I weave, and it's on the loom. It's completely flat, and it's quite wide. It's about 90 centimetres wide on the loom. And when I wash this textile it develops this pleating naturally. And what I'm using to, do, to make these kind of effects are a variety of different properties of materials, contrast of different materials, and one thing above all particularly, and that is the yarn twist. This is just a, a, a roving of fibres, and it hasn't got any twist in it, but that's the basis of what you might use to make a yarn. And if I just hang that between my hands, it just sits there passively. Now, you'd normally add twist to yarn in order to give it strength. It makes the fibres cohere, and it makes the yarn stronger. But if I add twist to this, something else happens as well. It's getting stronger. But it's also, it no longer wants to sit passively. And the more I do this, the unhappier it becomes. If I go on and on, it will be much happier if it's allowed to twist back on itself. And then it will make a perfectly balanced yarn. So a single strand is an unbalanced yarn. An applied strand in the opposite direction is a balanced yarn. And both of these are used in weaving today. But in ancient Egypt, they only wove with unbalanced yarns. Although they did know about plying because they used to do that for sewing thread which is quite interesting, and perhaps Janet will have something to say about that. So what happens is that a yarn like this is it's quite unhappy, but if it's left for a while, perhaps it's wound into a ball and it's left to sit for a while, it will gradually relax a bit and get used to being tightly twisted like that. But the twist hasn't gone away. But if you put that yarn in water, um, it will absorb the water, the fibres will swell. This yarn's under stress. And if you put more stress on by making the fibres swell, then you'll get a violent sudden reaction and contraction. So this is a, a commercially spun high twist yarn, and I've put it into a skein. Now, that's been resting for some time, and it may even be that the mill has steamed it a little bit, so it means that the weavers can use it more easily because it, otherwise it would snarl up. But it's still got the twist. It's still under stress, and if I put that in water... It'll absorb the water and it'll react. And so I made two skeins. And that one's before and that one's an identical skein after it's been washed. So that's, that's what you're working with, that sort of power um, from the twist in the yarn. And I feel this may be relevant to the possibility of natural pleating, as suggested by Rosalind. So now I'm going to use PowerPoint to explain exactly what I tried to do to test this idea out. So um, here you can see a pretty typical sort of picture of the kind of um, pleats that people are used to seeing on Egyptian paintings. And as Rosalind has said, there are te textiles existing which have these sharp pleats on. So we know that um, uh, pleats of this sort were put into garments, probably, as Rosalind has just proved, by pleating by hand rather than by using pleating boards. But what Rosalind pointed out was that there's a group of um, tombs of the 18th dynasty, where you can clearly see that people have got quite different pleats. They've got wavy pleats. And um, Rosalind suggested that perhaps 
what these might be were some kind of natural pleating. There's another picture, again, from the same tomb. Um, that's not really giving you any more information. I just love this picture because I think it's great that you can see the soles of their feet. Um, again, from the same tomb, um, it's very interesting that the uh, Egyptian artists are showing quite uh, distinct discrimination between different kinds of textiles. So it's not just uh, an artistic convention for these particular tombs. He's clearly wearing something very, very different from her. So, um, are there special reasons to think that these might be natural rather than imposed pleats? Because it is, after all, possible when imposing a pleat to impart a ripple to it. But there are some reasons. One thing is that uh, there's a Fifth Dynasty garment that shows some signs that look like they might be natural pleating. And also, of course, there are other long-standing traditions of natural pleating, some of them going back very far, particularly, for example, ancient China. So this is the Fifth Dynasty dress. Um, and the thing that uh, strikes you immediately is what a sort of, it's a very clumped arrangement. This isn't an evenly spaced textile. Um, and this kind of uh, arrangement seems to have arisen naturally in ancient Egyptian textiles because they didn't have uh, a system for precisely uh, distributing the yarns evenly. Uh, there were methods of spacing the yarn, but they spaced the yarns in clumps. So with a very open textile, the warp yarns would tend to remain in these, in these groups. Now this kind of thing is actually done in modern textiles uh, for effect, and modern designers would call this uh, arrangement cramming and spacing. So if I refer to cramming and spacing later on in the talk, um, that's what I mean. So uh, Rosalind felt that uh, this dress, which has sort of little bits of ripples at the edge, the skirt of this dress apparently particularly um, had uh, ripply bits down the side which looked as though they almost might be pleats. Now of course it, it looked as if that was probably just creasing but uh, the dress couldn't be washed but it was uh, put into a humidity uh, tent to try to get rid of the creases but in fact this seemed to really just make it crease more rather than less and little bits of it started to twist about and at this point Rosalind began to sort of think that this might be a dress that would naturally pleat if it were not so fragile that it couldn't, if it could have been washed, that it probably would naturally pleat. Now, in this diagram, um, again from Rosalind's paper about crimpled garments, um, we can see that this is a sort of cross-section through the fabric. So she's pointing out that we've got a clump of things here, and then just a couple of threads here, and then a, great, a, a dense patch a gap with just a couple of threads in the middle. Uh, so this, these, this is the variation in density in the fabric. Now, um, from my experience, the, the, the Egyptians wouldn't have had to do anything special to get these two threads in the middle. If you have a, a crammed and spaced arrangement like this, typically when you take the thing off the loom, and particularly when you wash it, uh, the, the threads on the edge of your densely packed stripes would just fall off into the space. So that's something that would just have happened naturally. And uh, Rosalind's suggesting that perhaps um, this contrast between uh, dense areas and open areas combined with the natural properties of the yarn might have created a sort of natural pleating like this. And I have to say, as a weaver looking at this, I was sort of very happy thinking, oh, look at all that space where the yarn can move about. Because when you have these high twist yarns that want to move, they do actually need a reasonable amount of space in the fabric, otherwise they can't really do anything. So um, when I first heard about this, I was very interested because at the time, um, I was already making crimpled garments. Um, so this is a sample of uh, a dress fabric that I had made, and that's in its loom state before it's been washed. Um, and so when that's been soaked in water, that's what it's like after it's been washed. And uh, here's one of these dresses uh, on somebody. Um, and so you can, <laughs> you can imagine that uh, I was visualizing uh, these dresses that uh, Rosalind was talking about as looking really something like this, uh, only white, of course. So um, 
I settled down to see if I could uh, investigate this and uh, work out what to do. But uh, you would think that because I could make those dresses, it should be easy. But in fact, uh, sadly, that wasn't the case because um, in a dress like that, I was, making, I was using different kinds of materials in the warp. I was using two beams on the loom so I could tension the warps differently. And I was also using co contrasts of weave structure to help me along. And all of those things are things that the ancient Egyptians wouldn't have used. So one of the interesting things about this project has been that uh, I have been denied almost all of the resources upon which I would normally rely in, in order to get these effects. And I'm just left with a few other things that I could try. Now, um, I immediately ran into difficulty because um, the uh, modern yarns that are uh, available to me, which I mean I use a great deal of linen in fact, but the modern yarns are actually not the same um, as ancient Egyptian yarns. So you would think the first thing is, well, why not make some yarns by the same method as the ancient Egyptians? But I found it very slow and difficult to do this. And of course, um, it was, people were commenting yesterday that you, when we come to do these things afresh, uh, we haven't got the skills that people had at the time. So no doubt people in ancient Egypt could construct yarn quickly and easily by their methods, but I found it difficult to do so. So I couldn't produce a great deal of yarn like that. Uh, but on the other hand, in order to weave sufficiently large pieces to see if anything's happening, you need a reasonable amount of yarn. So of course, I'm in a difficulty here. So what I've chosen to do about this is I do, I've done some small experiments imitating the Egyptian methods. Then I've used modern techniques of hand spinning uh, to produce some yarns. And then finally, I've used industrially spun linen as such as I would normally use for some larger samples where I felt that it was reasonable to do this, um, not invalid to do that. So, possible factors um, in uh, natural pleating. Uh, well, I've got a little group of things here that I want to look at in detail, but they're all interconnected with one another. It's difficult to separate one from another. So, of course, I will have to tell you about one and then another and then another, but they are all very intricately linked. So, first of all, the wetting and drying twist of linen fibres. These are intrinsic properties of fibre themselves before you've ever made them into yarn. Then there's the method of yarn construction, and then there's the twist direction of the yarn when you have made the fibres into yarn. Now, you'll see for both the fibres and the yarn, I'm talking about Z and S. And here... I've got uh, a diagram explaining that um, this would apply to both fibres and yarns, but it's used a great deal in the textile industry uh, for yarn twist. Uh, when you twist a bundle of fibres, uh, the fibres tend to lie at an angle. You'll see them lie at an angle with the axis of the yarn. And if they're sloping this way so that you could draw a Z around it, and the, the stroke of the Z would lie in line with the fibres, then it's a Z twist yarn. If it's the other way around, then it's, a, it's an S twist yarn. But though this um, uh, nomenclature is used for both fibres um, and yarns. So I'll first start talking about the, uh, the wetting drying twist of, of, of linen fibres. Um, many part fibres show spontaneous movements when they get wet and as they dry. And um, these movements are quite useful in terms of fibre identification. When you've got similar looking fibres, it can help you to distinguish between them. And this uh, paper by uh, Newman and Riddle is uh, an extensive uh, paper covering a huge number of different kinds of plant fibres. And their suggested method that you do this is linear fibres are quite stiff. You dip them in the water, hold them up, and watch the end of the fibre uh, turning round. And the fibre will first spontaneously turn in the Z direction when it's wetted. And then more slowly, as it gradually dries out, it'll turn back the other way. Actually... Um, if anybody's interested to look at this, I would say it, you can only really see this if this fibre is very, very fine. And so it, if you, you've got a thicker fibre, it's actually easier. Linear fibres are quite long. If you take a fibre and wet it and just let it hang, and you'll often see the movements quite easily then. So that's another, another way to do it. So, of course, one thing is, could this wetting and drying twist actually be a cause of, of natural pleating? 
The problem is you've got a wetting twist followed by a drying twist. So by the time the fibre is finished moving about, it's back where it started again. So uh, you, you look, it looks like it, it, to get any benefit from it, you'd need to, as it were, trap the twist once it had turned in the Z direction so that you could get the benefit of it as it turned back S. So um, I tried to test this by um, putting, using normal uh, commercial linen as the warp and then using um, wet linen fibres in the weft and I wetted them, let, it, let them turn Z, then use them as weft and waited to see what happened as they dry. But that wasn't, uh, you could see them rippling a little but it didn't really pleat the fabric. So there's not really perhaps enough force there from the drying twist to do anything on its own. Fortunately, of course, that's not the only thing we've got to work with. But while I was doing this, I came to the conclusion that this wetting and drying twist might be really important in the construction of yarns. So um, there's, t there's two different ways in which modern linen spinning is different from ancient Egyptians. First of all, modern spinning of, of all fibres um, is draft spinning, which is to say you've got uh, a fibre supply of continuously overlapping fibres which are being drafted out and then twist is being allowed to run into them. And uh, in modern times, most uh, fibres are twisted Z as an uh, initial twist. Now, yarn construction in ancient Egypt, um, linen in ancient Egypt was an assembled yarn, not a drafted yarn. Uh, linen fibres are quite long, and they were laid end to end and spliced at the ends. And then after the yarn had been assembled, then twist was added. But in this case, it was in the opposite direction. It was S-twist. So here's a, um, a very nice diagram from um, the book Ancient Textile Industry uh, by Kemp and Vogelsang Eastwood, which is really packed with really interesting information about the textile industry uh, in Egypt. And you can see there that um, two uh, fibers here are brought together. Uh, linen fibres are really quite long um, and they'd be overlapped just by a few centimetres uh, with an, an S splice. And so you'd assemble a yarn like this. You've got a fibre and then you've got a splice there uh, and a fibre continues to there, splice there. So you've got a whole series of them like this. Now once you've done that, um, that could be twisted up into a yarn to give it strength and to reinforce the splices. But it was also quite common to throw more of them together. Um, and in sense, this is one of the things that initially gave away the fact that linen, Egyptian linen was spliced. Because some years ago, people just casually assumed that it was drafted in the way that modern linen is. But what happens is when you put these together, they stagger the splices so that they don't come in the same place. Now, if the fibres come together and there's no splice, they just run together and it just looks like a single yarn. But where there's a splice, they can't do that. And in fact, you can see these splices in Egyptian linen. In fact, in the Nebermoon Gallery in the British Museum, there's a really nice big hank of linen, and you can see these splices ever so clearly. But also, you can actually see them in woven fabrics. So most of the time in this piece, uh, you know, it looks like a single yarn. But then there are just one or two places, if you look carefully, you can see that it looks as though it's applied yarn. And that was one of the, the, the things that really got people thinking about the fact that maybe these yarns were assembled. Um, and I think that this was disputed for some time, but um, some really excellent work was done at UMIST where they constructed linen yarns um, and with, then used electron microscopy to compare the structure of them. Um, and they're very fine draft spun yarns, uh, just look like pieces of old rope. Um, and when they spliced them, they, under the microscope, they just looked like a, a violin string. And you looked at the Egyptian linen, and sure enough, that looks like a violin string too, absolutely smooth and uh, hairy. So I think that's really, I hope, sort of settled that point once and for all, and it, Egyptian linen really is spliced. So um, they've spliced it S, and now they're twisting it up S. Um, and so... A question that a lot of textile historians have raised is whether S-twist really produces a better linen yarn. Uh, the argument has been that S-twist um, coincides with the fibre drying twist, which I described a few minutes ago. But do you really want it to coincide with the fibre drying twist? Um, 
a more powerful argument has also been put forward that it would be better to twist in the opposite way and then it, yarn and fibre twists would balance out uh, with changes of humidity or with actual wetting out. And personally, I find that argument a little bit more persuasive. So a further suggestion, um, notably put forward by Elizabeth Barber, is that perhaps S-twist simply relates to handedness. So um, we had a little comment about handedness yesterday, and I think that's something that's obviously not always thought about as being important. But uh, here we have some people spinning, um, and uh, the, the, the technique is to roll the spindle down the thigh and then throw it off and let it drop spinning. Um, and when a right-handed person does this, it naturally gives you a, a Z twist. And as Carolyn said yesterday, a large proportion of people are, in fact, right-handed. So I think this is very interesting and quite a persuasive argument, but, of course, it only gets you so far because... Um, which of these things come first? Is it that this technique is a very convenient way to twist up long fibres and it, the, it just happens to give an S-twist and people just accepted that? Or did they feel that an S-twist had advantages and this could drive the adoption of the method? Well, in some ways I don't think it's really necessary to worry unduly about this because obviously these methods evolve over time. Uh, you try things out, if you run into trouble then you simply stop doing it that way. Um, but one thing that has struck me because of the uh, experiments I've been doing with the drying, uh, the drying twist is that it seemed to me that perhaps the splicing is really the key factor here. The yarn was assembled by S-splicing and you've got a wetting twist of the fibres, Z and then S. And obviously this can um, assist splicing if the, splices are, are, the fibres are spliced wet. You can wet the fibres, they turn Z, you put them together, you splice S and then the drying twist is going to help you. Uh, to hold those fibres together. And when I tried this, splices in an S direction, especially if you've really wetted the fibres and let them twist Z, they do hold better. So I really think that might be the reason, um, the, the basis of, of it all. So um, now we see the whole sequence. So we've got some people over here and they're splicing. And then we've got some people here uh, adding twist to this ready assembled yarn. So obviously the twist strengthens the yarn and reinforces the splices. And of course, of course you want to, to twist S now because you don't want to undo your splices. Um, just as an aside, in the days when people thought that this represented draft spinning, which is to say you have to pull out the fibres, you're controlling the fibre supply, and then you're adding twist as well, which is quite, requires quite some coordination. Um, modern hand spinners working with drop spindles used to find it just unbelievable that anybody like this person here could be using two spindles at once. Naturally, of course, the archaeologists didn't worry about the fact that the Egyptologists didn't worry about the fact that this was going to be a really difficult thing to do because they hadn't tried it. Um, but of course, once you uh, assume that this is assembled yarn, it's just about possible to think that you could do this, though it would still be very, very skilled. Um, so for somebody like me who's not very well coordinated, I'm slightly consoled by the fact that not everybody's shown doing this. These, this person here and this person here are shown very sensibly just trying to make one decent piece of yarn. So finally, after all this uh, worrying about drying twists and everything, does S-twist really make a, a, a better yarn? I, I think not obviously for linen in general. And the argument for a Z-twist, as done, is done in modern times, is probably stronger. But the S-twist does work well in relation to splicing and I think that's probably why they did it. The reason I needed to spend some time worrying about S-twist was that it, one important question for me was would S-twist be necessary for natural pleating because if it was it meant that I couldn't use any of the modern linen to do any of my experiments but um, I spun both Z and S-twist yarn from myself by hand but using modern methods and I found they both could pleat the fabric. And so it seemed to me that it was reasonable to use linen, industrial linen yarns for at least some of the aspects, testing some of the aspects of natural pleating. So I've talked quite a lot about the yarn, but I think you need to sort of understand that, that those could be important factors, but which I'll come back to towards the end. Now I'm going to get on to trying to actually weave something. So the factors then that seem to me important are the amount of yarn twist, the yarn thickness, and the yarn spacing. So I've talked about Z and S, but 
I'll go back to this, a slightly expanded version of this diagram, because um, when you add twist to the yarn, you can either add a little bit, in which case the fibers lying here at an angle to the axis of the yarn, they'll only have a little angle, a small angle, and that will not be a very lively yarn. It'll be a yarn that moves a little, but not very much. As you put in more twist and the, the, the angle uh, gets bigger, then this yarn here would be a very lively yarn, a yarn that would uh, crinkle and uh, form natural pleats very, very easily. So, uh, just to give you uh, a close-up of what I showed you at the beginning, um, I'm, the samples I'm showing you here are wool, in fact, because I happen to have samples of wool that are available and it shows um, the effect very well. But these uh, stress react, rela uh, reactions, um, particularly in response to water, are shown by all natural fibres, and so they are relevant to linen as well. So my high, high and twist yarn before washing. After washing, it's going to do that. So um, uh, if I weave with that, as using that as a weft yarn, um, on a normal twist warp, then uh, a piece of fabric which is completely flat on the loom will end up looking like that. Um, the yarn movements take place within the fabric, uh, creating a sort of irregular pleated effect, which in modern times is called a crepon. So, of course, what I'm thinking of, and on the basis of Ross's suggestion, is that the Egyptians did know how to make a kind of crepon fabric, but they were using linen. So, my, obviously, my experiments are to find out if that could really be the case. So, what I've done is I've used industrial linen in the warp, and I've... Um, attempted to copy this uh, crammed and spaced arrangement that is so characteristic of um, uh, Egyptian textiles. And then I've used a variety of different yarns in the weft, different amounts of twist, different thickness and so on, to see um, what factors seem to be most important. So this is a typical sample. Um, and I found that, uh, as you might expect, some things worked and some things didn't. So a, a sample where I did get some natural pleating that's the typical, that's the same sample after it's been um, washed. Uh, it's somewhat irregular, not kind of quite as well organized as I was perhaps hoping. I was hoping the cramming and spacing might organize the pleats a bit more, but um, I'll, I've gone on to try to experiment with that in various ways. So, um, the things that I then tried, um, first of all, comparing different amounts of yarn twist. Now, because I use high twist yarns in my um, own work so much, I was pretty convinced this might be one of the most important factors. So that was an important one to try. Uh, now, the only difficulty is that not very many high twist yarns or linen yarns are available. On the whole, these kinds of textured effects, although they are quite widely used in the textile industry, um, things like cheesecloth and things are very widely available. People don't use linen for these fabrics very much. Silk and cotton um, and wool are much more uh, considered to be much more suitable, probably because of their greater elasticity. So um, if I wanted to be able to compare different amounts of twist, I was going to pretty well have to do it myself. So what I've done is take industrial yarns and then twist them up. So um, unfortunately, when I tried to do this, of course, I ran in pretty quickly to the fact that linen being quite inelastic uh, reacts rather badly to stress and when I tried to twist some things up very tightly they, I just found I kept breaking the yarn. So uh, it was back to the ancient Egyptians who obviously knew so much. Uh, we've looked at this picture before but what I want you to look at now is down here they're pulling the yarn out of these bowls and um, these bowls are thought to be um, spinning bowls and water was put in them so that the yarn would be wetted before it was twisted up. So um, water is useful in this respect because it, it's one thing it softens natural gums in the linen and so it makes the, the fibre softer and more easy to twist. They'll accept the twist more easily. Um, and also linen fibres are stronger when wet so that of course is a help. So here's one of these spinning bowls. Um, so you've got a bowl there and you've got a couple of loops down at the bottom and so you fill this with water and then it's thought that probably a ball of yarn would sit beside this it would be run in and then it would go to the spinner and so as she pulled the assembled yarn through uh, it would run through the water so I mean I'd love to have a beautiful bowl like this but failing that I set up this slightly sort of Heath Robinson arrangement um, 
So I got my uh, package of yarn here, and in fact, I just sat near a door. So I took this up, took it over the door handle, down through my loop, and then over here to where I was spinning. Um, and I have to say, this work, works really, really well. Uh, as you're pulling the yarn through, it's only fleetingly passing through the water, but it's quite adequate. It, 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 it makes things go so smoothly. So I, I just mentioned this, just in case anybody would like to try this at home. I really do recommend it. It, it sort of uh, works like a dream. So anyway, having been able to do this, I was then in a position to be able to just, just twist out my specific amounts and see what difference it made. So, for example, this is one where I'm at the bottom, I'm just using normal industrial linen as it comes as a weft. And then here I've added some twist, and then here I've added more twist. And you can see that the pleating gets uh, stronger, tighter, uh, with increasing yarn twist which is absolutely in line with the kind of things I normally get when working with other fibres. So um, I untwisted some, several samples of uh, industrial linen of different thicknesses to see uh, how much twist was on them. And I would estimate the twist, uh, the twist angle as being about 16 degrees. So and that was in all of the ones I tried. So that must be about what is necessary to hold uh, linen fibres together by the methods that are used in modern times. So basically in this one I added an extra 10 degrees of twist on this one and 15 degrees of twist on that one. So uh, that's clearly the important factor. But another one, thickness of yarn. Um, these are t this is the same warp used for both of these samples and here with a very fine weft and here with a much thicker weft. And so this clearly affects the scale of the pleating and as you might expect a finer yarn is able to curl in a, a, a tighter spiral and so make a, a finer pleat. So the spacing of yarn. Now clearly this is, looks as though it might be a really important factor. So um, my experience with the work I normally do is uh, you need a loose weave to allow the yarns to move. Basically what's happening with these high twist yarns is what they're trying to do as best they can is to run through the fabric in a spiral. I mean they can't quite because of the weave structure but they're doing their best to do that. And so they need movement to do it. So the cramming and spacing uh, works really well in doing this, but it isn't actually the only way to do it. Um, and the, the other thing about the spacing is the scale of the, the, the spacing definitely affects the result. So first thing I wanted to know, cramming and spacing versus sort of even spacing, um, I just wanted to check, having done these crammed and spaced samples, whether if I use the same average yarn density but evenly distributed, whether I still get the natural pleating, and I do. So that one on the left, that's uh, even spe spacing, and this is crammed and spaced, but they both have the same average density. But um, what I did find was that although you still get pleating, the cramming and spacing does give a rather different and interesting effect, and in fact I like it very much, because what happens is uh, these, although uh, yarns do slip off the edges of the crammed uh, stripes, they don't close up the space completely, and you do, it means you, you see the weft very much more, um, and it gives a more, uh, the impression, if you like, of a more open fabric, and in fact I, I like it very much, so I'm actually planning to feed this into my own work and produce some scarves like this. So the other question is that um, the scale of the, of the spacing affects the result. So you could think, well, you want a loose spacing, so why not have lots of space? But in fact, it, it does seem as though you can have too much of a good thing. If the stripes are wider, they tend to remain flat rather than curling. And if the spaces are very big, particularly with a high twist yarn, you can see that some of this yarn, the, the, the twist is sort of escaping in little twizzles in the gap. And so it, rather than pleating the fabric, you've got um, an open work fabric with little crinkles in it. So it's a different sort of effect. Though I must say, I think looking at the photo of the fifth dynasty dress, I think I can see one or two places where I think that's actually happening. That I think that um, there's rather perhaps a, a particularly high twisted bit and it's sort of escaping um, out of uh, uh, the fabric. So, um, finishing technique. Yes, I've pointed out that the basis of this is that the absorption of water makes fibres swell. 
and it puts the stress on the yarn. The yarns attempt to spiral, and in doing so, they pleat the fabric. Well, I found that um, it, it helps, actually, to pull the fabric about, because sometimes, although the yarn wants to relax, it doesn't do anything until you push it and move it, and I sometimes roll the fabrics between my hands, and particularly pull on them or wring them. And so, of course, I thought, is it all right to do that? And yes, fortunately, we've already had this picture from Rosalind, but... Yes, it's all right to wring the fabric, <laughs> which, and that definitely, um, if you've got a, a, a natural pleat, that tends to encourage it to pull it in that, in that kind of way. So, um, one or two other things. Could I get more wavy pleats? The, the pictures, I feel the pictures suggest uh, a more wavy pleat. I mean, all of these natural pleats look... Uh, rather soft uh, and undulating in comparison with the imposed pleats, but these do look very ripply. And of course, for simplifying my samples, I've been using just normal industrial linen in the wall. So I thought, well, in um, ancient Egypt, where many, many yarns are really quite highly twisted, um, the paintings, uh, you know, I mean, I think that as, uh, it could be that this ripple is because there's quite a lot of twist in the warp as well. They probably would have uh, treated all the yarns the same, I think. So I tried adding some extra twist to see if I could get a slightly more rippled effect. Well, of course, it's quite time-consuming to twist up these yarns, so I don't have very big samples. But that's one uh, with the normal yarn, and this is where I've twisted up the yarn, and I am getting a little bit more of a ripple. So I think that might have been something that was uh, quite important. So, I'm left with one or two unresolved questions after all this. Clearly, you can get some kind of natural pleating using the resources that the ancient Egyptians had. But uh, why do only 18th dynasty paintings show these ripple pleats? Um, well, was it only fashionable then? But then what about the 5th dynasty dress? That would suggest that these kind of techniques were known you know, over a, a long period. So, any, are there any other possible explanations of the ripples? Well, I just do have to mention this because people do sometimes say, oh, all these lines on the, the paintings, they're not really pleats, they're just creases. Um, well, I'm afraid I, I just, I think in this case, I just really don't think so. It's so carefully drawn. Um, and the distinctions between the different fabrics people are wearing, um, you've got a flat fabric here, he's only wearing a crinkly fabric down to here, and then he's got a flat fabric. Uh, and her fabric uh, ripples all the way down to the ground. The artists are really trying to make a point about the qualities of these different fabrics. And I don't think, although we think of these paintings as being very formal, I think it was quite a dis good discussion yesterday about how accurate they often are in terms of details. The artists are very interested in the details. Um, and one thing that uh, I noticed, having looked at this painting with great admiration in the British Museum several times, I finally noticed something which I didn't see the first time. If we concentrate on the feet. There's something that I think is very revealing. Now he's wearing uh, a smooth textured fabric on the lower level, the lower part of his body, and there's just a straight line there. Hers ripples all the way down, and then the artist has very carefully told us that it also ripples at the edge. Um, and I, well, I was saying earlier on today to Rosalind that when I, she first told me about these ideas, I was a little bit skeptical. But I gradually become more and more convinced that I think there really is something going on. And curiously, this may seem like a small detail, but I find this incredibly interesting because, as I've said, what these yarns, these high twist yarns are doing are not simply going up and down like this to make a pleat. They're actually going in a spiral. And so that means that the edge of the fabric goes up and down as well. And there's one of mine. Uh, this is just a bit of, I usually put a little bit of spare yarn at the end to stop the real stuff falling off. But as it's a contrasting colour, you can see how the edge will ripple in a fabric like that. So I think the artist has really picked up some special little detail that is really, uh, is really there. So just one other idea that I came across, which I thought was really interesting. Um, could these fabrics actually have been made outside Egypt? In which case they wouldn't necessarily be linen at all. And uh, McKay, uh, writing in 1924, points out that... Uh, he had seen a fabric that superficially looked very much like the paintings, which was being made at the time. Um, but he explains that this was being, this is it down here. 
I'm afraid this is just a photocopy, so it's not very clear. But um, he says quite clearly that they're making this fabric by using different types of yarn, some that shrink up more than others. And the contrast between them is making the rippled effect. Now, that's something I use a great deal, so I can quite see that's quite a possibility. But one thing that he doesn't seem to be very interested in is the fact that if this is going across the, if the ripples are going across the wall, then it can only be applicable to a very narrow fabric. So that raises the question, if we go back and look at these, are these, in fact, representations of the same fabric? I mean, at first thought, you'd think so. Oh, it's more of those ripply fabrics. But what's this, which is a shawl, if this is a selvage and this is ripples running across, this could be a narrow fabric, but this could not. This is a long piece of fabric right down to the floor. That ripples simply got to be in the wall. So I think it raises again the question of, there's an awful lot of interesting and probably quite accurate information in these paintings, but it is still difficult sometimes to be sure what you're seeing. So, uh, I just want to sum up now, really, the factors that I feel important in natural, uh, in natural pleating. Yarn twist. Well, many of the yarns in ancient Egypt were quite highly twisted enough to give a crepon effect if there was sufficient space. I mean, for example, um, Bellinger talks about typical twist angles of between 20 and 30 degrees. And I'm typically I'm getting really good um, results from about the upper 20s 28 degrees up over a little bit over 30 degrees and the samples from Armana some of those are twisted way up into 45 degrees and in a way to me as a weaver given that um, these are assembled yarns and since they're already holding together um, it's interesting to know why they were putting so much twist on and perhaps I'd be interested if anybody's got any ideas about that but anyway I would say that the, the evidence is that Plenty of the yarns were quite twi tightly twisted enough to give a crepe on if you gave them the space. Yarn density. There are quite a lot of fabrics that are loosely woven enough to allow, allow this to happen. So, um, and the cramming and spacing um, is a, quite an efficient way to uh, get a low average yarn density. Although, so far, I can't get any ev ev evidence that that seems to make the pleats any more organized. So, um, I would say that... Um, it would seem to me that these factors mean that it would be a crepon effect would sometimes have been difficult to avoid if they were making really open fabrics with these high twist yarns. So I think the difference is that, that we don't actually see that many of them. Uh, perhaps many more fabrics have survived that are more tightly woven, that were more robust. Uh, and of course the, the closer weaving would have prevented these effects. The other thing is that it, it's all, it would always be possible, um, particularly with moderate degrees of yarn twist, to sort of flatten these fabrics if it was an unwanted effect. Because unlike wool and silk, which are very um, springy, and where once you've got a crepe-on effect, it's really quite difficult to flatten it out. Uh, with linen, it does tend to stay where you put it. So if you flattened it out, and particularly we're using something like starch, uh, you probably could have flattened it out if you didn't want to. But I think they'd have, while the fabrics were wet, they would have, in some cases, if they were very open, been inclined to crinkle. And so people could see it clearly exploit this to deliberately make crepons if they wanted to. So I'd just like to mention a few, you know, as everybody says, when you start this stuff, you end up with more questions. Uh, you don't really uh, answer all the questions or new ones come up. Um, there are still some things, particularly things that I talked to, about early on in the talk, that um, I still feel, they, although they don't seem to be making an important impact, they might be doing something. For example, uh, spliced yarn construction. That makes a very compact yarn, and therefore it might react more strongly to twist, because that's typically the case of a, a compact yarn will show these stress, stress reactions more readily. Um, the way they're, they're using that long drop uh, when they're using the spindles, you sometimes see people are standing on a block even, so that once they've thrown the, the spindle, it will be a really uh, long drop. You're just, you can get a much more even twist angle by doing that than by draft spinning where you pull out a, fi a few fibres and let the twist run in, where you tend to get quite a bit of variation in the twist angle. And the twist angle will be the thing that would be the most crucial thing for making a really regular pleat. So, a more consistent twist angle might perhaps create more regular pleats. 
the direction of twist, I don't find any ev evidence that that makes an, any, any, any difference. And the wet and drying twist, so far, I haven't really been able to find a way to feel that I'm, you know, using that to improve the result at all. But of course the trouble is the spin direction and wetting drying twist could perhaps have subtle effects that would influence the pleating and I can't rule that out. The difficulty is the only way to test that is to produce quite a lot of yarn by the methods uh, that were done in ancient Egypt. Um, and this is not my main job as it were. And that's a <laughs> it's quite a lot of work to do that. So maybe I hope to do that one day. So um, I'll just leave you with this nice picture of the, the beautiful people in their beautiful clothes, whatever they are, enjoying themselves for, uh, for all eternity. And um, what I want to do now is to just show you um, a couple of pieces actually being finished. And I also have quite a lot of little pieces. I mean, we'll be coming up to the coffee break, so I'm a few minutes early. You may have time to look at these if you'd like to. So I'll lay these things out on the table. And in a minute, I shall get a bowl of water to um, do my finishing. So I've got two samples here. Um, one of them's got uh, quite a, a, well, a really tightly twisted um, yarn in the weft. And this is one of the few um, industrially produced high twist yarns. Um, but I mentioned that there's a, a nice uh, firm in Italy called Solbiati, and they do make high twist lin linen yarns. Though they're normally, the kind of fabrics they make from them are not really a pleated effect, but more of a regular, sort of slightly disturbed surface. And I think that's because normally they're weaving them quite closely. But that one will shrink very tightly, almost crunching it beyond being a pleat. And here I have one that will pleat up not so dramatically, but it's where I've added twists to a finer yarn. And that will make a more sort of delicate effect, or it should do. And that's a little piece. I normally, with some of these, I'll keep a little piece in the loom state that's going to be you know, for comparison. Okay, thank you very much. So as soon as I put this in, it's starting to do something, it's very unhappy. But of course I don't want it actually to be like that, because you see that's the only trouble if you just put them in, they, they'll curl up at the corners because the twist wants to get out anyway. So, of course, what I have to do, this is where the pulling comes in. I want this to actually distribute itself through the fabric, not just escape off around the corners. So, um, put it in and pull it. Hand hot, I said. <laughs> <laughs> And as I say, sometimes if they're a little bit reluctant, I sort of rub them a bit because sometimes the stuff will just stay there for a bit, wanting to move, but it, it needs a bit of a push. So, um, no, it's okay, but because it really makes it go nice and quick. It's just you don't want to leave your hands in too long. I mean, these things will move in cold water, but it just takes a bit longer, you know, and you're sort of standing there waiting, thinking, oh dear, <laughs> this time it's not going to work, you know. But, uh, and then, as I say, ringing it sort of helps a bit. So, that was a piece that was as wide as that initially. Can you see that okay? Well, anyway, you can come up. Um, as I say, we've, we've, we've got sort of a few minutes in hand, you'll have a chance to look at these before we go for coffee. So this one, this is where I've bumped up the yarn a bit myself, but it's a quite a fine yarn and I've only just put a bit of twist, extra twist on it so it's not going to react so violently. But it is still moving 
that's it sort of part way there and again a little bit of pulling and rolling and twisting encourages the weft yarn to do its work and this will make not so powerful effect but a, a more delicate pleat because it's quite a fine yarn So I think that if people were using this, you can see that given the variations that you could have in yarn thickness and spacing and so forth, you could get quite a range of different effects. And perhaps, you know, I just keep hoping some r more real textiles will turn up where you can sort of see whether these things are, are going on. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Are you willing to take any questions? Yes. Thank you so much. This, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to hear that you're talking about unhappy textiles, and I'll be <laughs> like, going to be more careful the next time. <laughs> um, I, I just had a remark about a uh, lot of things in the Hassan tombs that you were pointing at, um, where you said uh, it was your inspiration to use water for uh, the hunting and spinning. Mm -hmm. to um, I think what was depicted there, though, was plying because she has used one spindle and two balls and two yarns. Oh, yes, yes. Yes, yes, but that's what I was saying, that what they're doing is that they're, yes, but what, what's the difference is that when, na nowadays, normally, when you ply, you ply in the opposite direction to balance it out, but they're not, they're just running two together because they want to bump it, you know, to make thicker yarn. But there's, there, there, it's, that's why I say it's, it, you're taking two together. And that's why where you've got, when you haven't got a splice, they run together and they look like a single yarn in the fabric or in, the, in a hank. But where there's a splice, it, the, it keeps them separate. So um, she's, she's adding twists, but she's, I mean, you could add twists to a single strand if you wanted to make a really fine yarn. And some of the linens are just unbelievably fine. I mean, what, when I started doing this work, some of my textile friends, so looking at, I was using, you know, linen that's uh, 88 Lee, and, uh, oh, I think I've got it written down somewhere that, uh, uh, yes, uh, one of my friends said, uh, would, they, would they really have had such fine linen in ancient Egypt? This is 88 Lee, and... Um, the finest yarn that they were working with at, at Umist was, was 550 Li, and these are numbers where the finer it is, it gets higher. So, I mean, that's fa fantastically much finer. So that must really have been, I think, just um, they displaced it, single strands of, of linen as fine as they could pull them off the stalk, and then they'd have added twist to that one. But most of the linen, must, they must have required more, so you could add two or three and, and, and run them together. So I think they, they, are, just, they are adding twists, but they're just um, making a thicker yarn by doing them together. Yeah, yes. I mean, um, you can flatten it. I mean, when you wear these um, naturally uh, textured things, you can sort of flatten out. Um, I mean, a, a lot of people if, will be familiar with cheesecloth. If you have a cheesecloth garment, uh, like a dress, it'll sort of sit out a bit, you know, and you'll squash the, the, the crinkle texture. But when you wash it, it just comes back again. But normally only to the same extent, certainly for linen. I mean, I have found that with silk, it, it will change... Sub subsequent washes slightly but I think that's to do with the gum on the silk and it's a specific thing to silk but with linen I'd expect these to stay the same and then if I washed them they would come out much the same and it wouldn't change they won't shrink more and more and more 
you know, just as well, really, isn't it? Otherwise, <laughs> a garment would have a limited life before you had to hand it down to somebody smaller. <laughs> Um, a lee is the number of, of hanks of 300 yards um, that make up pounds of, of yarn. It's a, a, it's a yarn count system, um, which um, with all um, industry produced yarns, there are various kinds of uh, counting systems. Um, normally, well, you can either sort of say uh, the, uh, you've got... Um, so much weight of yarn, how um, long is it? Or you can ha take a certain length of yarn and say, what does it weigh? So there are these two systems. In the, the lee is quite a sort of traditional system. And I mean, it's a bit weird because you've got the wool industry, and in fact, you've got lots of wool industries, and they'd all have these hanks. And then so many hanks would make a pound, and that would be your count. But then they all had different ones. So, I mean, it's a bit of a minefield, really. But I can give you information about counting systems if you would like. Sorry? Cotton. Yes, cotton, it's eight, 840 um, yards to the hank, you see. So, I mean, again, it's just, it's just these arbitrary things that particular industries come up with. But anyway, the point was, when my friends said, oh, surely, would they have had such fine linen? I mean, it was ridiculous. The Egyptian linen could be incredibly much finer than anything that we have today. Yeah, much, much. Today. Yes, yes, yeah. One more. Mm -hmm. um, it's very important to um, not regard time as an economic factor. Um, are you aware of Bill Cook's experiments with trying to look at how long certain um, famous garments would have taken to weave? No, no, so but he looks yeah. At the um, girdle of Ramesses that we saw from Liverpool yesterday, and he estimates that that would have taken up to a year to weave. Mm. I'd like to thank our speaker again and all, both speakers this morning.